Good morning. Today we'll read from Mark chapter 14, verses 32 to 41. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed that, if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Once more he went away and prayed the same thing. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. Returning the third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Can you hear me okay? Okay. If you'll bow your heads with me. Our Father in heaven, we do come to you today, Lord. We ask that you open up our eyes and open our ears to see what you want us to see, to hear your words, Lord, because your words are truth. They are eternal. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but, oh, Lord, your word endures forever. Your word also promises that it will not go out void. So, Lord, we pray that your word impacts our heart, that the Spirit pricks us and plants those seeds deep into this heart of flesh you've given rather than a heart of stone that we try to make, Lord, and that we desire to bring glory and honor to you, desire your will and your kingdom. And, Lord, we ask that you give us more and more of your Spirit to be more like Jesus Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I've entitled this, Teach Us to Pray. I mean, that's kind of what it's about. And I had Mark read Scripture, seeing how Jesus prayed, to give us a real example of that, and how He went to the Father three different times and asked that if it was okay for this not to, to happen, then that was what He desired. But He didn't desire what He desired as much as He desired His Father's will. God's will be done. Jesus was fully man. He faced the same things that we faced. And He faced this... I don't even know words to put to it, this obstacle of the cross, which he went to with joy, but it being something that was going to be so painful, so distressful, so burdensome to his soul as far as a man, but something that he had to do as God, and he needed help doing that. He first prayed three different times, the scripture said, if this can be taken away from me. But he was also praying at the same time, not only that God's will be done, but that God would give him the power to do that, empowered by the Holy Spirit. And we see that from what we're going to read today and what we talk about so many times is called the Lord's Prayer. If you read your devotions, and that kind of pricked me the other day, Mark said I hadn't said as much about them, so I'm making sure that I do, because I had to sit there and myself say, have I just forgotten? Have I not done it? You know, and pricked my heart. But this week went along with it. Well, and sometimes they leap out there. August 29th's devotion was called Remember Your Creator. And that's what we need to do in and, in and out of every day, to be thankful, to be rejoicing always, praying continually, knowing that we have life because God designed and created us, and it was for His will that we would be in a relationship with Him. But yet we sinned. And it was His plan also to crush His Son to purchase us back. Are we living in the image of Christ? Are we living with the, the secrets of the kingdom that, that God has given us, with the power of the, of the Holy Spirit who hovered over the waters, who was with Jesus there and raised Jesus from the death? Do we realize that or do we just kind of continue to live as though everything was material and we were more in control of things than we really are? 
Because it's by grace not only you've been saved, but it's by grace that you're here today and breathing and living. Are you bringing God glory? Are you remembering your Creator? That's why it's written in Ecclesiastes. We are to remember our Creator. And I'm going to put why we still have life, because that's where the devotion went. Yes, it's time to do it in the days of our youth. Definitely, when you have more agility and everything with your body, hopefully, than as the days go by and you have less and less and less. But just because you have less and less abundant life in you physically doesn't mean that you don't have it spiritually and that you can't be a prayer warrior, that you can't do these things. The time of salvation is today. So live your life as this is the day of your salvation. Because there will come a time when you realize that this life was just like a vapor and it's gone. So are you living your life remembering your Creator? The next day's devotion had us reading from John chapter 17. And also so many times we entitle our Father who art in heaven as the Lord's prayer. That's not Jesus' prayer because He didn't have to ask for forgiveness from His trespasses because He never did that. <laughs> But if you read Jesus' prayer from John 17, and I'm going to read that if you want to turn there, you'll see a little bit more about the pattern that Jesus himself gave. And Luke talks a lot about prayer compared to the other Gospels and shows how much Jesus prays. That's why this came up in chapter 11 where we are, that when his, he was pray praying one day, his disciples asked him how to pray. And we kind of don't want to think that sometimes because we think, oh, every Christian should know how to pray. Well, let me just tell you something. Go ask a Christian to pray. And then see what answer you get. Because, ah, oh, well, I, 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 I. Because it is something that is difficult. You've got to put your mindset in there. You've got to get into the spiritual realm. John chapter 4 says the Father is searching out for those that will worship Him in spirit and in truth. And you've got to remember that God wants to hear your request, that He has the power to forgive, for, to, to answer all your prayer requests, but they might not be in your timing, in your way, and the answer might be no. Because He has so much more knowledge, infinite knowledge and power and ability. He's not bound by space and time or anything else. Our minds are. So it is hard and difficult for us to pray. So it shouldn't surprise us to, to say, Lord, teach us to pray. So as we read John chapter 17, I ask God to reveal to us how Jesus prayed, what his motives were. He gave up heaven to come and be the sacrificial lamb for the world. He lived to save others if they would accept him. John chapter 17, after Jesus said this, he looked towards heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those who you have given him. Now this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God and Jesus whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. I'm going to stop right there and just interject this a little because we're not preaching on John chapter 17. But Jesus came to glorify God. And we're to, to pattern our life after Jesus, to give up our life to save others, to glorify God, to finish the work that He has given you. And you know that you're a priest. I already mentioned that in the prayer earlier. You know that you're an ambassador. Do you realize what work God has given you? And are you praying for that work? And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. I have revealed to you to those whom you have gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Are you obedient to the word of God? Are you training up disciples and teaching them to obey everything that Jesus has taught you? That means are you obeying those things, even those difficult things, like turning the other cheek? Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. Jesus goes to the Father and then intercedes for you and I. Children, he intercedes for the world, yes, but he intercedes more for those that are children so that we will be like him. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. Are you a child of God? Because only a child of God can pray to the Father. 
They don't know God as Father otherwise. And so many people in this country say, we live in this country, one nation under God, so pray to Him. Those prayers don't mean anything because they're going up empty. They're, they are not children of the Most High. I'm not saying God doesn't hear the prayers of the unsaved, but He hears prayers of His children, which is what Jesus teaches us in this prayer and in, in, in the parable that follows. Are you a child of God? What child, again, doesn't seek guidance from his father? <clears throat> all I have is yours, verse 10, and all you have is mine, and glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world. You still have work to do. You need those prayers that Jesus is covering for you. And Scripture says he's, he's at the Father's hand interceding for you now. And I am coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them by the power of your name. And we'll get into that in a minute because it says, Hallowed be thy name. The name you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe. By that name that you gave me, none has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that Scripture would be fulfilled. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. And remember, Jesus is praying this prayer out loud to the Father so that we will hear it also, so his disciples would hear his prayer for them, and so that they will have the full measure of Jesus' joy in every circumstance, in every way. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. Why is that the case? Why is it when we're saved we, go, we don't just go to glory then? Because we have a job to do to be like Jesus in this world. That the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord of the harvest that the Lord will send out harvesters. And the very first thing, if you're praying that prayer, it has to prick your heart and you have to ask yourself, am I one, Lord? So we go. We've already read that in Luke. So that's why we need protection from the evil one because he's going to do everything in his power to stop us. A Christian who is not living like Christ, <laughs> the devil doesn't have to worry about, does he? But a Christian who is on fire, he's going to attack them constantly. And we need to realize that, as Paul says, we need to put on the full armor of God. Verse 16, they are not of the world, even as I am not of it. We're a citizen of heaven. We're supposed to fix our eyes on eternal things, to fix our eyes on the author and perfecter of our faith, to, get away, to throw away anything that hinders and any sin that entangles. <clears throat> as you sent me into, the, sanctify them by the truth, your word is the truth. As you have sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. Can it be more clear? For them I sanctify myself that they too may be truly sanctified, truly set apart and holy, truly doing God's will for His honor, for His glory. That's why you still have the life in you. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. Here we are 2,000 years later that all of them may be one, one family, children of the Most High. Then we hear the words again, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe. That's the point of our life, that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me. Wow. That they may be one as we are one. So when we're divided rather than united, when we're not united in our goal and in our prayer life, then we're not bringing the glory to the Father that we should. I and them and you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. That's the goal. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father... I want those you have given me to be with me where I am. I just have to pause right here. I mean, all this leading up, you've got work to be done and everything else because Jesus says, when the work is done, I want them to be with me, Father. Do you realize that? When the work is done, you rest. And that's what the Sabbath points to. 
We have eternal rest in Jesus Christ our Lord because what He's done. Will you deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow after Him? Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you love me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Like I said, I could spend days on this prayer. But just getting a glimpse of what Jesus prayed for us before He went to the cross and His desires for you to be protected, for you to do the work of the kingdom so that when the work of the kingdom was done that you would be with Him in glory forever in complete unity with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So are you a believer? Are you a disciple and a follower, not just a believer? Because if your actions don't speak your beliefs, then you need to go back and see if your beliefs are what they really are. And if you are a disciple or a follower, then are you working for the kingdom in all the ways that God has called you, called you to do? Whatever that is in the day that you still have the breath of life in you. Or are you living more for yourself? Living more for created things rather than the Creator? Are you living your life more so that you'll be known or so that God will be known, that Christ will be known and God will be glorified? So August 31st of devotion <laughs> fits this bill exactly. Many of us start our day with anxious thoughts. What am I going to do today? What about the problems I face today? I, 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 I. As the morning comes, we say to ourselves, this, there is so much to think about. So many things are dancing around in our mind. These thoughts easily produce anxiety and stultify our commitment to prayer. Right where we're at in this sermon. Are you thinking about spiritual things or about the things of the world? Are you thinking about God's kingdom being come and His will being done? Or your will and your things? Are you thanking God, glorifying God, worshiping God? Ask, asking Him, thanking Him not only that He's forgiven you once and for all for your sins, but to help you with any sins that you're still entangled with because you're a new creation in Christ and you have a job to do to live like Christ in this world. Luke chapter 11. That's where we're at. Starting in verse 1. One day Jesus was praying. We've got the pattern. He was in a certain place. Doesn't matter where it was. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. When Jesus said to the, then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, Lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine is on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, Don't bother me. The door is already locked, and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks the on the door, the door will be open. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? I could have broke out just the Lord's Prayer and spent forever on those um, because there's so much there and you can take them back in the Old Testament and go over the Scriptures and maybe it'll burn in your heart as it did with the guys on the road to Emmaus that these Scriptures point to Jesus. But I want to take all of this together because it all goes to one day Jesus was praying in a certain place and when He finished, one of His disciples said to Him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. That we see a need to be taught to pray. That it has to be part of our spiritual uh, defenses. That we 
have to go to the Father in prayer, the righteous, uh, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, that He wants to hear, that we can come to Him at any time of the day, that He works through a praying people, that it's okay to be taught about it. All these things we need to be sure of. And then Jesus uses these further teaching illustrations to teach us even further along. So all parables, if this is a parable, point to Jesus. All scripture point to Jesus. If this is a parable, I scratch my head a little bit because of Jesus' own definition because it doesn't say that there were anybody here but his disciples. We don't know that. But we know Judas was there. So we can call it a parable for that matter. We can call any of the teachings a parable, but I want you to realize again what parables mean. And I don't, won't go down that rabbit trail because I've already discussed that a little bit. And that there are different types so that you don't just take things here and say, well, um, suppose you have a friend. Is, there, is this relating to God? Um, so many times this parable is called the persistent neighbor or the neighbor at midnight. Um, and Scripture teaches us to be persistent in prayer. But if you go with that point out of here, you miss the point because that's not what it's about. It does say to keep asking, keep seeking, and keep knocking. But it's about a life that will take anything to God in prayer because your life is not your own. It has been purchased. And you have a Father in heaven who is available at all times. And some of the things that you think are trivial, He wants to hear. He wants to hear how your day at school was, just like an earthly father. And he doesn't care if you called him at 3 a.m. in the morning and you need something, son or daughter. He's there for you. And if a loving earthly father is that way, how much more is your heavenly father going to do that, especially if your prayers are based on his will and his kingdom so that you'll be like his son? I guess I can quit now because I kind of went over it, but we'll break it down. It's not about that keep on, keep on, keep on, keep on. You can. But if you have the attitude that that's what it's about again and you get in those prayers, you'll get into a prayer point. At some point we're like, I've kept on doing it, Lord, you haven't answered my prayer this way. It's not what it's about. Is your prayer set on the kingdom of God that His will be done and you have an understanding that even if this happens which you cannot fathom happening and you cannot understand why that you give God enough glory and have enough faith that He'll work it out because the Scripture says He works out all things together for, to good for those who love Him. Do you do that? Do you understand that? I don't understand many things. And I cry out many times in anguish, Why, Lord, this way? just like Jesus did. And I've done it more than three times. But I say, whatever your will is, because that's where that prayer life takes me back to. Because I've been saved and I've been bought and purchased with a price and I need to glorify you, so I need the answer to this. It's that He'll give them the Holy Spirit. Not to necessarily give you peace or to comfort you, which is what the, the word means, paraclete, but to go along beside of you also to walk through this world so that you can be like Christ in this world. So I want to give you some examples to start out before we dig in that Luke has already told us about Jesus' prayer life. In Luke 5, verse 15 and 16, yet the news about him spread all the more so that the crowds of people came to hear him and be healed of their sickness. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and played. prayed. There's a compare and contrast here again, which you're going to see here. The news spread about Jesus... People came, but they came for the wrong motives. What did Jesus do? He, go to, he went and prayed to His Father in heaven to keep Him focused on the task. They wanted to make Him as King already to avoid the cross. But He said, No, Father, Your will be done. Don't let me be enticed by these things, anything else. And the world that was coming to them at that point just wanted their bellies full. Luke chapter 5, verse 33, they said to him, John's disciples often fast and pray, and so the disciples of the Pharisees. But yours go out about eating and drinking. Here we've got the example that John fasted and prayed, but let's get Jesus and try to trap him and say, you guys are having too much fun. And you know Jesus' answer is, well, the time to celebrate is now. There's work to do later, guys. I won't be here, but guess what? I won't leave you as orphans. The Holy Spirit will be here. In Luke chapter 6, verse 12, one of those days when Jesus went on a mountainside to pray and he spent all night praying to God. He, at the next day, picked the 12. This was a bigger decision for him. I don't know what all Jesus prayed for all night long, 
But I know one of the things in his prayer life, because I see it in John 17 when he prayed for his disciples, just the same, and even he even mentioned the one that was doomed for destruction. I can't imagine Jesus' prayers for, for Judas. He never gave up praying for Judas, even though he knew what the outcome would be. He still prayed for him. In Luke 9, 18, once when Jesus was praying in, a private, in private and his disciples were with him, he asked, who do you say I am? And Peter made his declaration that you are the Messiah, the, the chosen one of God. You have the words of eternal life. Where would we go but to follow you? <clears throat> and then in Luke 9, 28 and 29, about eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him, and they went up on a mountain to pray. He took them with him to pray. As he was praying... The appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a, fl a flashing of lightning. Now I'm going to go off on a tangent here. But what if Jesus wasn't praying at that point? What if they were sitting around playing cards? That's why I said a tangent first. Would his face shone in glory and been, been transformed at that per point? He was praying. We didn't have to worry about what he was doing. And he took his disciples with him to pray. His disciples were supposed to pray with him in the Garden of Gethsemane. But as there was their practice a lot, they were sleepy. And they couldn't stay awake with him. So you have the pattern that Jesus set here before praying. So now you need to ask yourself, do you have a problem praying? You should at this point. And your answer should be yes. If you're not, I'm surprised because we can all increase in our prayer life, in the urgency, in the uh, repetitiveness, I don't want to use that word, in the diligence, how's that, in your prayers in the sincerity of your prayers. We, in uh, Sunday school, one of the things that struck me is they were talking to this guy whose brother was saved at his deathbed, basically. And he asked the one brother, he said, did you ever think about giving up praying? And my and, and instinctive answer was, yeah, of course he would have. And, but his answer was, no, how could I? He's my brother. Wow, Lord, teach me to pray where I don't get distracted, where I don't give up praying, that I continue to pray and pray and know that those prayers are going up to the Father and knowing it's His will that my loved ones are saved and everything else so that it helps me keep on building that ark. Prayer is so important to the life of a Christian and God desires it. <clears throat> No wonder Jesus' disciples asked their master to teach them to pray. You know, it was also the pattern of the first church. Luke wrote Acts also, and in Acts 1 verse 14, they all joined together constantly in prayer. Not constantly in worship, it was mentioned here, but constantly in prayer. Along with the women and, the mother, uh, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers, all of them. Men and women combined in praying. In Acts 2 verse 1, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Well, what does the previous scripture tell us they were doing? They were in prayer. We know that was a part of it. In Acts 2 verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, the breaking of bread and prayer. They said, we are devoted and committed to this. We are all coming together so that we can be iron that sharpens iron and we'll be devoted to these things. In verse 46, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. What if we did that more? Would we see more people coming to, to Jesus? I don't have the answer, but I know we don't pray like the first church did. We don't, I, I remember growing up, this spurred that, and I probably heard it in some of the sermons that I listened to, but you know, we used to have Wednesday night prayer meetings, Friday night prayer meetings. I don't hear of that anymore. We have Wednesday night functions or Friday night functions, but they gathered for prayer meetings back when I was just a wee boy, not too many years ago. Acts 3, verse 1, one day Peter and John were going to the temple at the time of prayer, a dedicated time each day for the people to gather together and pray. 
I remember a couple times we did that as a ministerial where we said one day out of the year, let's get together at this certain time and pray today because there's an election coming up. There's this coming up. There's something. This was every day for every day, for daily bread, for, for, for instance. In Acts 4, verse 24, this is after Peter and John's release from prison. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Together again. And they didn't pray, Lord, keep us from this trouble. Here's what they prayed, starting verse 29. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. That was their prayer. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly and not to go off again on a trail. This is not them getting the Holy Spirit for the first time. This is a refilling of the Holy Spirit just as Jesus taught his disciples to pray and he said that the Father will give you more, we'll use that as a word, of the Holy Spirit. Not that you're not filled completely already, but that you'll get this refreshing or whatever to know Oh, this scripture is revealed to you. Oh, I have this sense of peace, this encouragement to go on and face the things that are ahead of me. <clears throat> After they prayed, the place where their meeting was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And what happened? They spoke the word of God boldly because that's what they asked for. And it was the power of the Holy Spirit that caused that. All the believers were in one heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions were their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy pe persons among them. For, that, from that, for from that time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distrib distributed to anyone who had need. Wow. And it began with prayer. So Lord, teach us to pray. And I'll remind you again, we call this so many times the Lord's Prayer, but it is different than Matthew's account. And Luke writes specifically as a doctor would write his prescription specifically. So you can think about that when we go back, but I'll just start you into it. This is Jesus' answer. It is our model prayer, not the Lord's Prayer, but the Lord's model prayer to us. When you pray, okay, that has to be the first question. How often do you pray? Are you praying at least a specified time of day? They did. Are you gathering together with one another and doing corporate prayer? Are you praying with urgency and persistence to keep asking and seeking and knocking? Are you praying about the little things as well as the big things? How are you praying? The statement that Jesus gave here is to teach us to pray. To know that first of all, it was there's no I here. It's not when I, the you is, that is given here, is plural. When you all pray, pray this way. Father, that we all collectively have a Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Now, as far as Father goes, that would have been unheard of. Because we didn't even speak God's name. We didn't spell God's name. His name was hallowed. And we can't cry out to him personally as an Abba Father. That was unheard of. It was blasphemy as far as that goes in that day and time. But Jesus was saying you can pray to God Almighty as your Father. Not someone else's Father. Your Father. Each of you. Because you're all children and you have a Father who is in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Well, you can come up to me because you know me and say, Alan, fine. You don't have to say Pastor Henson or Mr. Henson. But with more authority, the name means a little more, doesn't it? You don't come up to, we'll use President Trump just instead of Biden, just because. <laughs> he was president. We could use President Reagan, but he's not here anymore. And you could say, Mr. Reagan, but that's kind of taken away from his title. You could say President Reagan, but you wouldn't come and say, Ronnie, unless you knew Ronnie very well. But you can cry out, Father, and it's not disrespectful. But you want his name to be hallowed because so many people who wouldn't even pronounce the Lord's name or put vowels in or anything else really didn't honor his name by the way they lived, did they? And the point of this is so that you'll live. This prayer is so that you'll live. This is your mo model prayer. 
Do you respect and hallow the Lord's name? Because if you don't, you'll never pray, your kingdom come. Because it'll all be about me, myself, and I rather than his kingdom. It'll be about the things that I've got to, to do and accomplish at least first before I can do this. Even if these things don't mean anything, I still need to get this castle built on sand first before I can go do your kingdom. Because, you know, I've started this castle already and, you know, I, you know all these things. Then we go to give us each day our daily bread. Boy, now it becomes really personal, doesn't it? But it's still us written in here. But it becomes so much more personal because I've got to look and say to myself, am I going to be satisfied with daily bread? But I've got to go right back to the Israelites and learn that they longingly looked back even though that they had manna, uh, this food from heaven that they couldn't even describe. But, but the same old, same old all the time, I just kind of get tired of because I look at the physical rather than the spiritual and know that if I'm in the wilderness, all I really need is God to supply my needs so that I will live. Why? So that I'll make it to the promised land. And what He has provided me, at first I, I pray so much, but then I get tired of it and longingly look back and say, I don't want the same old thing. Will I be able to pray, give me daily bread? in this land of so plenty where I can go get whatever I want. And that doesn't mean you can't. It means what are you longing for? Will you be satisfied with a daily allowing God to take of your needs to be dependent on Him? You have to go back in Luke's writings and remember where He already sent the, the, the apostles out, the 12 or the 72, and said, don't take anything with you so that you'll learn to rely on Me. I'm paraphrasing there. So are you willing to pray that? Give us each daily bread. And I can't expect you to be satisfied with daily bread and pray that prayer unless I am also. Forgive our sins. Oh, well, wait a minute. Let's go back to the bread a minute. He isn't talking about physical, guys. <laughs> Jesus is the bread of life. Yes, he's talking about a physical thing. And if you can't understand the physical, you're never going to understand the spiritual. And you're not going to feed on the bread of life and drink living water, are you? So you'll never understand this, forgive us our sins, because you haven't been truly forgiven. Or at least you don't understand, so you can't truly forgive others as we already learned from the Sermon on the Plain. Because at this point, it reads this way, forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone else who sins against us. I already understand this as a disciple. I need help living it, though. <laughs> I understand it. I understand I'm forgiven, but days to day I forget about it and I get focused on myself and I get angry with my, my friend, friend over here, not even my enemy, and I let the sun go down on my anger. Instead, I need to realize that you have forgive us, forgiven us of our sins, and we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Well, that's strange in the first place, because God wouldn't lead us into temptation. And there's no temptation that befalls us that He doesn't give us a way of escape. But if He's not leading you then guess where you're going to go? So is the Holy Spirit leading you? Because you know you have a Father in heaven. You're praying regularly to Him that His name will be hallowed, that His kingdom will become not your own, that you are satisfied with whatever it is. If it's, a, if it's a dose of literal bread and water that day, because you're in a prison somewhere, you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. And know that you're in there for whatever the purpose is that you don't understand. And later we have this as a result of Paul being imprisoned. We have all of these letters. And then we get this parable, if it's called a parable. Then Jesus said to them, verse 5, Suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight. The word doesn't mean midnight as we understand it. They talked about watches, a time period. So it means any time between midnight and 3 a.m. They went to bed at sundown more, got up at sunrise more. So this is we in the middle hours of the night. No way I'm waking up my family then. They live in a one room uh, probably where they sleep, possibly even have the family in a bed, whatever that might look like, and animals in the room or sleeping underneath them, especially if they needed the warmth, if it was that time of year and everything. We don't understand that. But if you understand that a little bit more, if I'm sleeping in that back bedroom, 
with three other little kids and you come banging on my door, I'm going to be kind of upset if it's after midnight. I'm probably going to be kind of upset if it's after 10. Okay? But remember, I told you before, this is kind of a contrast thing. This is not meant to describe God here. And you say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. Why? Verse 6, a friend of mine on a journey has come to me. Not my friend. What am I worried about? Oh, they practice hospitality. I get it. And it was important to them. Okay? And I have no food to offer them. Why can't he wait till 6 a.m.? He's not going to starve in that period of time. Why in the world are you coming to me now? And you called yourself a friend? Guess what? Tomorrow you're not. Okay? Right? I mean, there's where we're at. But hospitality was serious. We don't know why the guy came. You can't put all those things in there. This is an example Jesus gave to teach us. Suppose, there we go, suppose the one on the inside answers, don't bother me. I'm trying to figure out how did he answer without waking up the kids. But it doesn't matter. We don't have to figure all that out again. The door is already locked and my children and I are in bed. I can't give you anything. I gave you a good reason. Go away. If you come back in the morning, we'll probably still be friends. Okay? I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need and wake everyone in the house up before you wake up everyone in the neighborhood. You, I don't even know what works. Friend. You wonderful friend. Next words of Jesus. So I say to you, who is he talking to? We already have it here, his disciples. Maybe there's someone else in the crowd that he's talking to, but he's teaching his disciples how to pray. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. Three continual things. You keep on doing it. I keep on talking. Ask, 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 ask. Seek, 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 seek. Knock, knock, knock. Don't stop. Isn't that how your prayer life should be? Not audaciously rude, but keep asking God. If it's the salvation of your grandchildren, why would you stop? Or your brother, as the example was earlier. Why would you ever give up and stop? Why wouldn't your prayers at sometimes be, Lord, please, he's my brother? Why would they not be? And why wouldn't a father understand those prayers? And he'll answer your prayers. It's not as easy as a child asking you for a machine gun. You know the answer's no. We don't understand God's ways. His ways are higher than ours, but it is his will that all men be saved. I pray that prayer all the time. God, you gave me one son. Don't let him die and not know you. There's the urgency that much more. I had one. If I had two, maybe, but I wouldn't because I'd love them to. You know, I, no. And thank you for four grandchildren. Now let's start talking about the four grandchildren. And let's talk about the children that they'll have and the children that they'll have. Everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be open. Jesus rephrases it to let you know again, if you ask, if you seek, if you find, and those are changing. First you're asking, then you go out to seek, then you find the door and you knock on it. So they're changing in degrees. If you do those things, there will be results. Period. Never, ever, ever forget that. Because if you don't watch it in prayer life, you'll tend to forget it. And say, God, why haven't you answered my prayers? Why well, instead when you ever say that, say, why haven't you ever answered my prayers yet, Father? But I know that you will in your way, in your time, and I thank you for it. Because Scripture tells us clear that God is available and that He will answer those who come to Him that are His children. I stress that again because you don't have the relationship otherwise. You can't call me Father unless you are Jacob. You can say, I'm a dad. I am a father, but you can't call me that myself because you're not related in that way. So verse 11, which of you fathers, now it's taking you back to the, to the physical as fathers, if you have a son that asks for a fish, he asks for food here, not for something else. We're still on food, food that nourishes your soul and sits, or nourishes your body and nourishes your body in this case. Since we think that way, it's still on nourishment, although it's a spiritual that we should be thinking about and thinking about it as spiritual nourishment. If he asks for a fish, will he give him a snake instead? 
We've asked for nourishment. You don't have to worry about if it's a fish and think, oh, all these things. If he asked for something to eat to live, would you give him something that's going to cause him to die? No. No, not even if you're a bad dad. Or let's give you one more example. If he asked for an egg, food again, who, will give, who then will give him a scorpion? No one. That kind of dad needs to be taken out and shot, right? But you have a heavenly father who cares for you that is nothing like this. It's a contrast. If you then, though you are evil, and I need to realize that, and yet I have a, the right to come to God to prayer because I'm a new creation in Jesus Christ, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Is that the end result of your prayer? This is what we're talking about. Jesus taught us how to pray. That we want God's will to be done over anything. That His kingdom be come. We'll be satisfied and we won't search our hearts after other gods, material things, whatever you want to say. We won't be adulterous. That we realize we've been forgiven so we just automatically forgive others. And the reason that I'm praying this prayer for myself to be healed of cancer, to whatever it is. I don't have cancer, by the way, that I know of yet. Or, yeah, I said yet. That I will at all. Let's, let's leave the yet out. Whatever it is, am I asking for me or asking so that I can continue to be a witness? I pray that prayer all the time. I pray that my health keeps up till God calls me not to be a verbal witness anymore. Not for my glory, for anything else, but He's given me a desire to preach and I try to figure out if I can't do it this way, can I do it with a tube or something? You know, because I'll still want to cry out to Jesus. But do I want to go through the pain and suffering of things in this world? No. None of us do. But if I do, so be it, as long as I can glorify God. So are my prayers focused on the kingdom or are they focused on myself? Because I know that when my prayers go up, that God will answer them in some way. I don't have to worry about it being at midnight or any other time. I don't have to be audacious in those prayers. I just need to cry out to a father. But sometimes I do cry out to my earthly father. Why did you do that? Not as much now, but when I was a child, I did more. But know that his ways are right and that he will answer, and he will answer by giving me his spirit so that I can be more like Christ in this world if it simply means comforting me because I don't have the answer to why this is happening. But the end result is going to be so that I can live a life to be more like Christ. This is our model prayer. And Jesus is telling us that He will not forsake us. He's showing the Trinity here that God will answer. He's a loving Father that we can come to and that you will have the presence of the Holy Spirit not just baptizing so the Holy Spirit is with you, but in the times of need even more, if you pray, you'll have even more there, more fuel in your tank, which was already full, guys. <laughs> you have no doubt. Jesus prayed three times, that's why I started that this way, to His Daddy in heaven, that the cross might pass from Him. But He also prayed not His will, but the Father's will, and the Holy Spirit came to give Jesus, the Son of God, strength to face the cross. If the Holy Spirit gave Jesus that much strength, just think how much He can strengthen you. Luke 22, verse 43 and 44. An angel from heaven appeared to Him and strengthened Him. And being in anguish, He prayed more earnestly. Because He was in anguish, but also because the Holy Spirit came to Him. He prayed even more intensely, so much that his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Have you ever called that before? We say all the time Jesus was in such uh, um, dis disarray, whatever word you want to say, torment, that he, his capillaries burst and he had blood mixed in with his sweat. But it's as a result of the Holy Spirit coming to him and he prayed all the more earnestly to be able to face the task that was at hand. Because the Holy Spirit came to, to, to give him the strength that he needs. And we are all God's children. We all still have the breath of life in us to be his ambassadors, to be different, to be holy in this world. So I'll ask you this question, these couple questions. 
Are you praying this kind of prayer? Are you praying this kind of prayer so that you can live as Jesus lived and face whatever cross is before you? Are you aware of the power of the Holy Spirit to live the kind of life that Jesus did? Lord, today, teach us how to pray as Jesus taught us. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for Jesus' words, for his teachings. We thank you for the gospel of Luke. We thank you that he wrote an orderly account of what we are called to believe as disciples of Jesus Christ. We thank you for the freedom that we have in this country to come and worship you without persecution, Lord. Lord, we do thank you for all the things that we have in this world. But let us not be focused on the things that we have, but to be rich because we don't know that when our life will be required of us. And we don't want to be like the rich fool. But we want to be rich and gracious as Christ was rich and gracious. To know that the grace upon grace upon grace that you have given us is so that we will be gracious to others. So that we realize that the comfort that you have given us through the Holy Spirit is so that we may not only be comforted, but so that we can offer comfort to others. Help us to to pray more for daily bread, not only for ourselves, but for each other, so that we will seek and, fo- and find our strength and our fulfillment in you alone, Lord, so that we don't get distracted as Martha did and not know the time to worship and versus the time to serve, but also, Lord, to fill us with strength to serve and face whatever that we may, must face in this world to bring you glory and honor. We thank you and praise you for the time that we have together, Lord, as we feed and nourish on the words of life. Lord, fill us with your spirit to live a life that brings glory and honor to you. For thy will be done, thy kingdom come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yes.